Now, I like many really like Neolithic archaeology and Neolithic Britain and uh, the flint tip darrow is something that features so much in our understanding and what we perhaps see in our mind's eye of what Stone Age life might have been like. And it's likely that many of you know that there are lots of different types of arrowhead as well as there are in the Middle Ages and other parts of time. There's a particular kind of arrowhead that's always had a, an interesting place really. And I've got a bit of a soft spot for it. It is of course the chisel arrowhead from the Middle Neolithic. They're really odd objects. They, they don't have the refined tip, as, as you can see, of a, a leaf point or a later oblique point, and certainly not that iconic shape or form of a barbs and tanged arrowhead from right at the end of the Neolithic. There have been lots of theories as to what these might have been, whether they were arrowheads at all, or whether they could have been arrowheads that were not particularly effective. They may have been for either scaring people or animals or for not inflicting particularly deep wounds. Perhaps a social taboo about killing people but you want to scare people enough not to steal your cattle and property. There hasn't been a great deal of experimental archaeology done into these. As a flint napper and having made quite a few of them before I can say they're fairly easy to make. You can identify the perfect kind of flake straight away by looking at that razor sharp fresh edge and then you've really just got to trim off the sides. But usually you'd expect an arrowhead to be that way up with the point facing forward and the wide bit at the back but we've actually found a few hafted versions of these that have still got the wooden shaft intact to know that these were hafted this way. So do they actually work? Well it would be a case of actually testing these to find out whether they do actually work and I'm going to use some ballistics gel to actually act as that proxy material rather than an actual carcass to actually see whether these work. Well Clearly this arrow would have done a bit of damage and uh, comes as perhaps some surprise that uh, as well as the arrow flying reasonably straight it's hit the target and made quite a hit. It's really driven straight into this ballistics gel block and if I tilt and actually look at the wound it's not just an arrow that's gone in and created a hole, it's actually opened up a wound channel around the arrow shaft and it's holding it open and that's important because if this had struck an animal or a person it would mean that that wound channel is open, it hasn't just closed up and sealed behind the arrow or around it. So blood would be constantly coming out at this point and that's particularly important if you don't hit a vital organ, you're wanting your prey to bleed out quite quickly so you don't have to track it for a long period of time. Now I'm going to try and pull this out now and really see how deep it's actually gone into this gel block. And there we go, you can see it's really gone quite an impressive depth into that. Considering the width of this arrowhead and the fact that it's not pointy at the front, that's really an impressive depth. And this is why experimental archaeology is really, really valuable for trying to answer questions as to whether arrowheads like this could have actually been used for hunting, whether they were any good or whether they were just something for show or arrowheads at all but perhaps with a bit more experimental research and perhaps a few more shots and maybe some practice could perhaps start to answer some more questions about the role of these chisel arrowheads in Middle Neolithic Britain.